So we're in Matthew chapter 1. Go ahead and get that ready. We're going to be jumping around a little bit today, but Matthew chapter 1, it's a familiar story. And I came across this this week. Uh, I get Time Magazine in the mail, and the front cover of Time Magazine for this week was 2020 with a big red X through it, and the title of that magazine for this week was, It's Been an Awful Year. Anybody relate to that? A few of you, right? And inside, there was this article written by Stephanie Zacharek, and it's entitled, Our Awful Year. And she puts it this way, as she's rehashing the year and saying everything that's happened. She said, our most debilitating threat this year was a sense of helplessness, and it ran unchecked. And isn't that true? as our nation and as our globe tried to reckon with a global pandemic and how do we approach it, we might have felt a little bit helpless. As we tried to pay for school bills this year, we might have felt a little bit helpless. As we laid some of our loved ones to rest this year, we might have felt a little bit helpless. As we've transitioned jobs or moved locations, we might have felt a little bit helpless. And the Christmas story this morning speaks specifically to that helplessness. That Jesus, the God-man, come to this earth to save his people in their helplessness. So let's take a look at that this morning. Matthew chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 18. We looked at this last week, last episode. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged, to, uh, was engaged to be married to Joseph, but before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Matthew continues on. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly. So he decided to break the engagement quietly. And we looked at this last week, right? As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, The angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Matthew continues on. She will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And we linger here a moment, because this was the message from the manger that we looked at last week. Jesus, the one who came to save his people from their sins the echo, the message coming from the manger to us that Jesus came to save. But there's another message that we're going to look at this morning, and it comes in the following verses, Matthew chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child, she will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And this specific set of words is packed with so much meaning. Emmanuel, God is with us. This particular construction is found only three other times in the Bible, and it comes from Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, and Isaiah 8, verse 8, and verse 10. But yet, even though this idea of Emmanuel, God is with us, the specific words are only found four times within the Bible. They are a theme that is prolific through the narrative of Scripture. This idea that God is, a, is desirous of being with his people. Genesis began that way, right? God creates Adam and Eve, and he's with humanity. He's walking and he's talking with them. And Adam and Eve chose to separate themselves from God, remove themselves from that relationship. And ever since, God has been dying to get back with us. And finally, after years, Jesus is on the scene, Emmanuel, God with us question that pops into my mind is why did God choose this method? That Jesus would come as a man clothed in human garb to come as Emmanuel. Why did God choose it this way? Out of all the options God could have had, he could have snapped his fingers and sin would have been gone. Why did he choose 
Jesus. Why did he choose Emmanuel? Why did he come as a baby boy? Reminds me of uh, the movie Inception. Has anybody seen Inception? It came out a couple of years ago. The main character, Dom Cobb, the, protagoni- the protagonist, he's a, he's a prolific heist man. He goes in and he'll steal money and do these kinds of things. And in the plot of the movie, instead of the perfect heist, he and his team of specialists have to pull off the reverse of that heist. Their task is not to steal an idea in their corporate espionage that they're doing, but their task is to plant an idea. And I think that's a beautiful picture of what Jesus did, what God did through Jesus, that he's coming to humanity, placing on the clothing of humanity so that it's not done by force, it's not done by coercion, it's not brought upon us in a way that's very strange, but God says, I need to become like one of them so that they'll be able to listen, so that they'll be able to hear, so that they'll be able to know that I'm a God who wants to walk with them every step of the way. Emmanuel, God with us. The Gospel of John breaks it down for us a little bit further. Turn there to John chapter 1, verse 1. If you want to follow along, we'll have it on the screen as well. You may know this passage well. It's John's account of creation. And he takes us back to the very beginning. He says, in the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Continues on in verse 2. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. The word gave gave life to everything that was created, and his life brought light to everyone. John connects the word back to creation, and he says the word was with God, and the word was God. This idea of God's word being present from the beginning, but it doesn't finish there. We jump down to verse 14 of John chapter 1. The word became human. Some of your versions may say the word became flesh and made his home among us. He dwelt among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. Can we marvel at that for a moment? Can we ponder upon the unfailing love and faithfulness of this word become human? We've seen his glory. The glory of the Father's one and only Son. John said this word, this word that was at the beginning, the beginning of creation has now become flesh. He's become human. The God of the universe who set everything in motion desires so strongly to be involved in our humanity to the point that he would take it on as his own. And the beautiful part about this story is that this was not something that was just happened after Adam and Eve sinned. That Adam and Eve sinned and God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit get together and it's like, all right, so what are we going to do? No, this plan had been forged since the beginning of creation. Ephesians chapter 3 verses 10 and 11 put it this way. God's purpose in all of this was to use the church to display his wisdom and its rich variety to the all-seen, to the unseen rulers and authorities in heavenly places. This was his, what? Eternal plan, which he carried out through Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul, in his letter to Titus, puts it this way as a promise in Titus chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. I've been sent to proclaim faith to those God has chosen and to teach them to know the truth that shows them how to live godly lives. This truth gives them confidence that they have eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised them before the world began. The story of this God-man, this Jesus who is going to come to this world was not an afterthought. It was something that God had in his mind before he even spoke into existence our world. He says, we've got to have a plan in case they choose otherwise because they are so precious to me, I cannot let them go. And the God who does not lie, which let me break it down for you, means that he doesn't lie. Let's just get that straight real quick. 
He promised them before the world began that Jesus would be our Savior. And John, the revelator, as he's opening up the revelation of God and writing it down for us, writes in Revelation 13, verse 8, describing Jesus as the Lamb who was slaughtered before the world was made. Jesus from the beginning of time, knew that his role in our lives would be someone, be the one to come and to redeem us. You might think for a moment, hey, hold on. So the lamb was slaughtered before the world was made, but we know Jesus died 2,000 years ago. And what's up with Jesus as a being? Is, is he God's son that was birthed? Is he son of God? <sighs> we pause for a moment and think about it. I like to think of this illustration. A soldier is described as a soldier even before the soldier goes off to war, right? Definition of a soldier would be one who fights for a particular nation to protect that nation and performs the duties of a soldier. But before deployment, soldiers that head onto a plane to Iraq or anywhere else in the world, they're defined as soldiers, right? Even though they haven't performed the acts of war, they haven't been on the battle lines, they're called soldiers because they're committed to the cause. And they can be called soldiers because we know that they are going to fight for our rights and fight for our freedom. And in the same way, God was committed to our salvation before we even knew we needed saving in our individual lives, and in our corporate lives as humanity. God was committed to saving us. Ty Gibson puts it this way in his book, Sonship of Christ, page 175. Because God is love, God was eternally committed to becoming one with humanity in order to redeem Adam's fall and rectify Israel's covenant failure. God from the beginning of time longed for our salvation and he had the plan in motion before Adam and Eve were even created. Before you were even born, God was desirous of your salvation and committed to doing whatever it takes to make that happen. And here's the beautiful thing. This Emmanuel, God with us, that's something that won't change in the future. God coming as a human, taking on human form, those scars on his hands and on his feet, his back, his head, he will wear for eternity as a reminder of his unfailing love and his faithfulness. Francis Nichol puts it this way in the SDA Bible Commentary, page 901. The two natures, the divine and the human, were mysteriously blended into one person, Divinity was clothed with humanity, not exchanged for it. Jesus was fully God and fully human, one in the same. And if you ask me, like, how does that work? I have no idea. And let's not pretend we do. Because I think we lose the beauty of who Jesus is when we debate about his ontology, his state of being. We'll miss his incredible, infinite ever unfailing faithfulness and his love that he has for us. Jesus came as a human. Our God is with us. This week on our Instagram page, quick plug, if you're not following Elevate on Instagram, you need to do that, at this is Elevate TX on Instagram. Uh, it's, we're trying to curate an experience for you that you can get some positive things during midweek, and uh, we also want to get some feedback from you. So we posted a question, um, and we posted the engaged question. We said, who is Emmanuel to you? And somebody posted this in response to that question. Uh, they wrote this. Emmanuel is not God far from me, nor is he God in my past or God in my future. He is God in my present, Emmanuel. And when I I read that, I was like, wow, I was blown away. That's so profound. And the question may come to your mind and say, hold on, but you're saying God's not in the past, God's not in the future, he's in the present, he's Emmanuel, and he came as Emmanuel, but Jesus still isn't walking this earth. How do we know that God is still Emmanuel in our present? This 
next portion idea that I'm sharing with you today absolutely blew my mind and I had to have a moment of worship in how good our God is and how he orchestrated the writing of Matthew. Because Matthew chapter 1 begins with this idea that God is with us, the Emmanuel, right? You come to the end of of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. And for the good Adventists in the room, you've got this one memorized, right? As you go, make disciples, baptize, teach. And then what does Matthew finish his gospel with? Matthew, chapter 28, verse 20. And be sure of this. This is Jesus speaking. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Matthew begins his gospel setting up saying, God is with us. God is here. He's Emmanuel. He's right here. And Jesus, the last words that he tells his disciples is that my job as being God with you is not done yet. I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. No matter what you face this week, no matter what you've gone through, God is with you. Jesus is with us in this everyday sense, and he's with us in this idea of the narrative arc of of Scripture. Divinity has been mixed with humanity forever, and not only is Jesus with us in the idea of the physical presence and walking beside us, but he's with us in that he is clothed in humanity. That forever God is with us, a part of us, one of us. He is human and divine, the one that has come to save. Ellen White puts it this way in Desire of Ages, page 24. Since Jesus came to dwell with us, every son and daughter of Adam may understand that our creator is the friend of sinners. Anybody a sinner? I know I am. Chief of all, right? That's what Paul says. For in every doctrine of grace, every promise of joy, every deed of love, every divine attraction presented in the Savior's life on earth, we see God with us. When we experience that love, when we experience that joy, we experience that grace from on high, it is a reminder to us that Jesus is God with us. I invite our praise team to come back up. I want to share with you a story to finish this out. There's a book by the title Bruchko. B-R-U-C-H-K-O. It's written by a guy by the name of Bruce Olson, who was a missionary to the country of Venezuela. And he had a burden on his heart for the indigenous people called the Motelone. And he got down there and, you know, the classic missionary story, right? There's the clash between the witch doctor and the Christian. And the Christian is trying to change the forms and the customs of the people to to make them more like Jesus. But too often Jesus looks like a white man with blonde hair and blue eyes and a suit on Sabbath morning. But Bruce Olson was not content with that. So he fell in love with this people, the the Motelone, and he learned their language. It was a people group that had not been reached yet because they were violent and they were vicious. But all he started to do was begin to love this group of people. And time passed and he was able to endear himself to them because he desired their good. He loved them and he traveled back to the city and he talked to some friends and says, I need to get some medical, medical supplies for these people. I need, to, I need to help them. So he loads up with these medical supplies and he comes back to the village where they knew him. And a couple of days pass, a couple of weeks, a couple of months. And all of a sudden, a horrendous, epidemic of pink eye breaks out. For us, you know, you might have laughed if you had pink eye. It's not that big of a deal, right? You take some antibiotic and you're good to go in a couple of days. But pink eye itself is not necessarily the issue. It's the infection inside that could lead to some more dangerous things. And his heart is breaking for this people because he sees the witch doctor in the, in the village is, is praying and doing these incantations and trying to heal the people and nothing is working for them. 
And he thinks to himself, if only I could get one of them to take this medication that I have, I know it could be fixed immediately. But then he realized if he just went and worked outside of the system, that if he went rogue and just shoved some ointment in somebody's eye that, well, A, he might get attacked by them, but B, he's circumventing their culture and he's circumventing them as a people. So he gets this idea. He finds the guy in the village, the guy that has the worst case of pink eye, takes his fingers and he rubs them in the man's eye. And then the fingers that are now covered in pus and infected with pink eye, he rubs them in his own. A couple days later, obviously, he gets pink eye, right? You don't go around and like, oh, let me get pink eye. He goes back to the witch doctor and he said, this ointment works. And would you pray over me and use this ointment on my eyes and see if it works? She does it, ointment in his eyes. A couple days later, his pink eye completely gone. He goes back to the witch doctor and he says, this is, this is the solution and it's going to work for your people too, I promise. I'm not going to go around your back and I'm not going to go do this for you. I will supply this solution for you if you'll go to your people and share it with them. She goes and takes the ointment and goes from person to person around the village, putting it in their eyes one by one and within a week, everybody is healed. In that moment, I... I I recommend reading the book Bruchko. It's an incredible story uh, of Bruce Olsen and everything that he did. But in that moment, I believe he was Jesus to that people. He said, I can't come with my own preconceived ideas and this idea that I've just, I've got everything figured out because I'm an American and I'm westernized and here's how you guys got to live. He says, no, I've got to figure out a way to relate to them on their level. And he worked within the system to bring about healing in their community. And because he chose in that moment to walk alongside the witch doctor, there would be hundreds of people from the Motolone tribe that would come to know Jesus. Not the westernized, blonde, blonde hair, blue eyed Jesus, but the Jesus who had brown eyes and black hair and walked the trails of the Motolone people. The question. We asked a moment ago, who is Emmanuel to you? Who is, who is Jesus? Who's Emmanuel? Emmanuel is God with us. The God that wants to come within humanity and plant the idea of salvation and grace. And he did that with 12 of his disciples and many other unnamed people in the gospel. And we today come in celebration of God with us. We can't stay there. We must leave this morning taking God with us to others. Whatever that looks like for you, however you contextualize the gospel within your frame of reference. So the question I want to leave you with this morning, looked at Matthew, story of Emmanuel, God with us. Who is Emmanuel to you?